David Mayer, a physiology pre-med junior, and ITA Section 11 labs. And I'm Seth Bassam, ITA Section 12, and I'm a chemical engineering senior going to graduate this spring. And today, we're going to talk to you about Lecture, Lecture 16. <laughs> First, we're going to be talking about maintaining the purity of your culture. We're going to have two cultures, one of which we're going to be heavily working with. This is called our working stock. Now, as we, as we uh, make many different transfers for different biochemical tests, um, our purity is more likely to be compromised by those transfers. So, um, in, in case the, uh, the working stock is compromised by contaminants, we will be using a reserve stock as well. Now this reserve stock, we will be able to use to inoculate a new working stock in the case that your working stock is compromised. Now the working stock is inoculated with a loop um, and you're going to want to make several passes down the slant of auger. The reserve stock is going to be inoculated with your needle and it will be a single stab straight down through the center of the auger. Now the reserve stock will uh, uh, restrict the growth of of the microbes that you inoculate it with, and that's because uh, nutrients and uh, waste production will be limited in that stab. And from there, we're going to move on to the procedure. The procedure goes as follows. Using one isolated colony, we will record the colony morphology. Next, we will inoculate the working stock. After that, we will perform a gram stain, and finally, we will inoculate the reserve stock. For the next part of lab, we're going to be learning a bit about fermentation. Seth and I learned a little bit about fermentation one day when we were sitting on the couch enjoying an ice-cold beer. We were obviously 21. We were wondering how this beer is made. So, we went on the internet and we learned the process. After looking at it, it seemed simple enough that he and I could repeat it. So, we began to brew beer. The process is actually generally pretty simple. It first involves making what's called a wort. This wort consists of sterilized water that's been boiled, grain, malt, and then hops. Each of these has a specific function in the beer. The grains and hops are for flavor, whereas the malt has more of a function as the sugar that the yeast eventually added will eat. The next process is cooling the wort to room temperature, then it's put in a carboid, and yeast is added. And that's when the whole fermentation process begins. It's left like this for around a month, and uh, some of the sugars are turned into alcohols in the liquid, and CO2 is released during this process. Later, a priming sugar, which reactivates the yeast, is added, and the wort is bottled individually. Bottling it seals it so the carbon dioxide can escape, carbonating the beer, and the yeast makes more alcohol in that process. This is actually very similar to the process of making wine. Now we're going to be finally talking about the preparation of wine. Wine is made from a must. Now must is the equivalent of wort in brewing beer. Uh, a must is a juice from anything that can be fermented. This includes fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Now fermentation is an anaerobic metabolic process. This process uses organic molecules to regenerate our electron carrier NAD+. In this case, our, a, our organic molecule used as an electron acceptor is acetaldehyde. Here in this, in this diagram, we can see that acetaldehyde reacts with NADH to recreate NAD+. Now, this NAD plus is very important um, as it is used to continue glycolysis and will reform after glycolysis into NADH. Obviously, glycolysis is important to continue as it creates ATP, and ATP is energy to the cell. In wine fermentation, uh, we commonly use Saccharomyces cerevisiae of the variation Ellipsoides. This yeast enzymatically breaks down fruit sugars, glucose and fructose. These two sugars are monosaccharides. In this diagram, we show glucose, 
which is then converted to pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid is, uh, releases CO2 and becomes acetaldehyde. Then acetaldehyde reacts with the NADH to regenerate NAD+, and this becomes our final product, ethyl alcohol. The concentration of alcohol in wine is a function of the amount of sugar in the must and the tolerance of the yeast. I've drawn this diagram here to show you. As you can see, if you have a high amount of sugar and a high tolerance of the yeast, you'll have a high amount of alcohol. Here we see a high amount of sugar and a low amount of tolerance. I put a star here to show that this is the limiting factor, so you'll result in a low amount of alcohol. Again, here is a low amount of sugar and a high amount of tolerance, and the sugar is a limiting factor, giving a low amount of alcohol. And obviously, if the tolerance is low and the sugar is low, then it'll give you a low amount of alcohol. Wine can generally range around 12 to 14 percent alcohol, whereas beer is around 4 to 10 percent. Now, when brewing wine, there are a lot of different factors that can affect the taste of wine. This is likewise true for brewing beer. Now one large factor that can affect the taste of wine is obviously the variety of fruit. There are grape wines, apple wines, cherry wines, even dandelion wines. Furthermore, the inclusion of skins and seeds is another large factor. Skins and seeds have tannins in them that seep into the wine. This is the difference between white and red wine. White wine is brewed without the skins and seeds, and red wine is brewed with the skins and seeds. Rosé, for example, is pink because it is brewed with skins and seeds only for a short period of time. This is also a very important factor in the taste of beer. Tannins are found in hops, as well as the grains that are used for brewing beer. And tannins are actually um, reactive with light. And that is why many uh, wine bottles and beer bottles are tinted to reduce this effect of light. For example, Corona tastes so different because it is in a clear bottle. The final thing we'll talk about today is the procedure of your wine experiment. We'll start by adding a pure culture of wine yeast to a sterilized or pasteurized juice. This juice has been poured in a jug already, so it's aerated with around 300 parts per million of oxygen. During the early growth phase, yeast grow aerobically, taking up this oxygen, and later oxygen is used up and anaerobic conditions result and ethanol is produced. The amount of ethanol produced can be measured by comparing specific gravity readings. You can look on the virtual edge for more specific uh, procedures and how to use your specific gravity reader.